Hello, everyone. This is Serious Trivia. Welcome back to another episode of our Age of Empires: The Mongol Empire campaign. As we pick things back up in the Battle of Lignitz, uh, 1241, or Lignitz. Uh, I think it's spelled a little differently depending on what language you end up being. Uh, I think it's the site of a battle uh, in Eastern Europe uh, against a Christian army. Uh, not really fully Christian. They had some Knight Templars and uh, the Knight Hospitier. Different Christian Knight organizations took part in this battle in very small numbers alongside uh, the local army of, I believe, Henry II of uh, Cilicia who is defending his kingdom, obviously, for dear life, as the Mongols is six years in, in their second Western campaign, uh, also known as the campaign of the Elder Princes, or the Elder Brothers, or the Crown Princes, uh, Zhangzi, Zhang Xizheng, it's how it's called in Chinese. And the reason why it's called this is, it's all the grandchildren of uh, Genghis Khan, uh, Batu being the one who inherited the Western Khaganate, uh, the Kepchek Khaganate or the Golden Horde as it will eventually become, uh, is technically leading this campaign as this is the land that he is given for his uh, Khan title. Uh, but in reality, the military strategies are coming from Suputai, who we covered in the very first uh, campaign we played, the Kalka River. Uh, he's one of the four hounds of um, you know, Genghis Khan, he's still alive. He's quite old at this time, but he is the military mind behind all of these royalty uh, that is taking part in uh, the campaign. Pretty much the four main sons of Genghis Khan we talked about uh, in Shu Chi, the oldest, who has some uh, background Angu, you know, people argue that he might not be a true born of Genghis Khan because the wife got uh, taken, kidnapped right after their marriage and was rescued and came back pregnant. So it's a little bit fishy who his father actually is. And then we have Cha He Tai, the second son, and then Wo Kuo Tai, the third son, who eventually becomes the official Khan after the Kuo Tai happens. And then the fourth son, uh, Tuo Lei, who is the most talented military mind of these four and controls about 80% of the army. And after uh, Genghis Khan died, Tuole actually was kind of the regent for a while because he had all the power, but he wasn't officially voted in because you need to be voted in at the Koratai, the meeting of all the lords. And at the meeting, many of the brothers convinced him to hand it over to the third brother because, as I mentioned, although he is probably the least talented, he got along with all of the brothers um, the best. Uh, but even so, uh, Having your youngest brother uh, controlling 80% of the army is a very scary thought. So he eventually would um, kill his younger brother, or not directly kill, but indirectly cause the death of his uh, younger brother, Tuole. But this battle, uh, this entire Western campaign, is these four guys' sons, right? Batu is the oldest. Uh, brother's second son, uh, the oldest son died. Uh, he inherited his father's land, uh, the Kepchek Khaganate, and he is technically leading the campaign. Then you had uh, multiple sons of uh, Cha He Tai, Wo Kuo Tai, and uh, Tuo Lei's oldest son, uh, Munker, who led the siege of Kiev in our last battle. So all of these princelings of the Mongol Empire are kind of testing their mettle out here in Eastern Europe and they're absolutely crushing it. For the past six years, it's been nothing but destruction uh, in Europe. A few small victories by certain European forces uh, from time to time, uh, but overall they're on the back foot as the Mongolians are pressing down onto uh, Hungary. And I think the king of this time is Bela IV, and he is gonna be putting up a defense actually a couple of days after this battle. It's actually surprising they picked this battle because this one's not so grand. I mean, sure, the Mongolians did win this battle and uh, they took more losses than they would have liked. Uh, it mentions divide and conquer here, which I think is misleading. You read this and you think they divided the locals and conquered them one by one. But in reality, the Mongols were so, uh, you know, winning so hard out here in Eastern Europe that they divided their fourth about of 80,000 men into four separate armies. And then those separate armies 
uh, subdivided even more as they just, you know, kept winning. So it felt like they didn't need that many men to tackle uh, their next battle. They could split up and destroy certain points. And this battle is only a quarter of the Mongol forces uh, led by, I think, the sixth son of Cha He Tai, the second brother, or the second son of Genghis Khan. His sixth son, I think his name is... In Chinese is He Dan. I think in English is like Kedan. And another son of the current Khan, so uh, Wu Ko Tai's son as well, but I forgot which son, maybe third son, uh, they're all princelings. They led each a 10,000 man unit because the Mongol army was organized in 10,000 man chunks, uh, it's called Wan Hu Zhi, right? Uh, so 20,000 together, 10,000 each of them and they were fighting a group of local forces with the aid of the Knights Templar, as we mentioned, which is probably why they feature this battle, uh, because after this battle, the Mongols took some casualties to the point where this 20,000 men force uh, couldn't really join with the main army, uh, but they did uh, play a role in stopping reinforcement from reaching the battle at uh, Mohi, which is a river uh, in uh, closer to Hungary, I guess. Uh, but we're in the Poland Hungarian area. And that's the battle where King Beli IV will make his final stand with the Hungarian Empire and get absolutely crushed to the point where Hungary, as a kingdom, is without an army at that point. And he had to flee. He basically fled to another kingdom to survive. Uh, most of the Hungarian royalty would die in this battle. So I would have thought, you know, the Battle of Mohi River would probably have been the battle to showcase, but I think they are trying to play up the, you know, participation of uh, the Knights Templar uh, to kind of facilitate the storytelling and perhaps showcase some of the units they made for that. Um, and speaking of Knights Templar, I think the Pope at this time was trying to resolve some conflict uh, between the, the European household and they were trying to use the Mongolian threat as this common bond to join everyone uh, without too much success. Uh, but at this point, most European royalty have realized the Mongols are a real threat as they have been burning down Eastern Europe for the past six years. So let's hop in here and see how uh, this battle is portrayed here. With Kiev secure, the Mongols planned a coordinated drive deeper into Europe. They would divide the forces of Poland and Hungary by attacking both kingdoms simultaneously. At Liegnitz, the old armies of Europe would be tested against Mongol-style warfare. Right, I think this is also the period where the Europeans attribute the introduction of gunpowder into warfare, as the Mongols absorbed a lot of the technology from Song China, which used uh, gunpowder weapons, uh, rustic ones, huochong cannons, uh, you know, gunpowder tied to arrows and that sort of thing. And the Europeans in the 13th century has not experienced this, uh, you know, evolution in weaponry yet. And uh, this is going to be kind of the introduction of adapting gunpowder weapons to medieval warfare going forward. And this battle is led by Genghis Khan's grandson, uh, Bider, uh, or he is the son of the current Khan. I think, I, I, if I remember correctly, the third son of Wu Ko Tai, uh, but I, that could be wrong. Uh, but he's also there with another fellow princeling. Uh, they made their first of their dual attacks on the Central Europe. The Polish army scrambled to face them, arriving at the field in scattered group. Yeah, this is a large army of conscripts. This is not a very professional army. They did get reinforcement by Knights Templar, as I mentioned, so there were some more professional uh, soldiers uh, that were among them, but they made up very small numbers. Uh, kind of unfair in terms of what they're facing up against, a very organized you know, war machine in the Mongolian forces, even though they you know, in total outnumber the Mongolian forces. Uh, I think by, I think it's like 30,000 to 40,000 versus 20,000, um, you know, almost doubling the force. But if you compare quality, it really wasn't close. So let's see how this plays out. Alrighty, the Duchy of Silesia, the fertile grasslands of Lignitz, led by Duke the Henry Mongols II, would face Europe's greatest armies, led by the forces of Poland. An army from Bohemia was marching to assist the Polish forces gathering at Liegnitz. Together, 
they hope to stop the Mongols before Western Europe succumbed to a full-scale invasion. All right, let's group our melee. They could defeat the scattered Polish army and force the Bohemians to withdraw. And then we group our range with our siege weapons. We have a couple of... Let's group these as one. We probably just need to pump out frontline units for now. By raiding the enemy's farmland, the Mongols could plunder valuable resources. Right, so I guess no production for a Thai. It's a military landmark. Gunpowder technology from their Chinese subjects, and now brought with them the mighty nest of bees. So we need to get gold by. Projectile weapon. Allow whoa, 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 whoa. The enemy Don't overchase. Devastating barrage of rockets. As the farm smoldered and smoke billowed to the sky, the Mongols claimed the spoils from the wreckage. We'll use the stone. Why not, right? Okay, let's go this way. That's all the roaming armies on the field. That's the Polish army. But first we can get resources. Let's do that. And then we'll just keep pumping out units towards our army so that they can get replenishment. I guess we can sell some of the excess that we have. Gold need to go to research. I don't think we need to research defensive outpost. I got some army coming up right in front of us. We're gonna destroy this group first, I guess. Let's see if we have enough force to go with them. Alright, there's an army. Let's see if we can draw them over one by one. Three here, two here. There's archers. I wanna loot behind. Oh, there's also a lot of knights. Alright, I wanna kill the archers. Three, move up, move up, move up. Do I have more units? Come, come. Come, come. Three, increase their attack. Two should really try to break through, but it's kind of hard. We got a tank for our front line as well. Trying to get some damage on the archers. They don't get free hit on us. I don't know if Nessa Beast is good at killing knights, but it's okay. We're holding. We're losing a lot of our front line though. We're not making enough fast enough. At least we killed a good group of them. The Mongols defeated the Polish detachment and continued their unrelenting drive. Alright, we need to get more units first. Let's see how we can do that. Or pick off. Like, we can go get that resource, I guess. There's the Bohemian reinforcement that we want to avoid, but we just took heavy losses there. Let me group them together, I guess. I actually call them all three, and then like these are the twos. Yeah, that's probably better. We should try to kill that roaming army by themselves. be free. I don't see any armies nearby. I gotta sell wood. We need to buy food. Gongchengqi. <laughs> Nasty beast speak Chinese? Gongchengqi, siege weapons. Uh, we should wait for a bigger four. That's a good clump. Hmm. We need to try to isolate them, I think. Like one at a time type of thing. Not sure how we should do this. 
I don't really want to use the gold for that. Can I hockey this? So I can just buy food whenever we have extra gold and then sell wood when we need gold. These are our melee. We we'll call these two. Let's move forth. We're gonna get a couple more, but we gotta move. There's four group here. We gotta kill both. Kite back, two kite back. Why is our three like not even moving? No, no, no. Uh, that was a waste of a unit. Should we just move them together, I guess? Hmm. That's a tempting target. We got 13, 14 minutes. It should be fine. Do they have archers? If they don't have archers, I would just... Okay, they don't have archers. Good. Pick off some small targets. More knights, more... Ooh, those, are, those look fancy. Elite heavy knights. We move up. You guys go join the fight. Move up, move up, attack. We don't have enough front line. Go, 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 go. Get back, let the leader tank. eliminated Poland's knights, dealing a critical blow to the European forces. Don't overchase. Well, that hurt us too, like quite a bit. Not gonna lie. Now move them up, clean out these last few knights. Bohemian reinforcement coming soon. They still have... Did we just kill like one army group? And they still have like 41 units, I think. I'm assuming that's how it works. Bring us more infantry. I mean, I'll take some range, but like maybe later. Alright, you guys are all three. You guys are two. Okay, that's that's how it's gonna work. Let's go. Only against two groups. Although this is like heavy infantry, so I think the range should go first. Alright, kite back. Fight. And then try to get them around. Oh these are oh there's there's a few archers. Alright, this is fine. Is there a research that I forgot? I think so. Oh, that's the last one. Okay, that's fine. To buy food again. Nope, I, why did I buy wood? Alright, let's re focus a bit. Ooh. Go over here. Alright, this was quite simple to kill this group. There's a few units on the ridge. Oh, there's a big camp here. I don't think we're supposed to fight that yet. But is that part of the, the deal with the Bohemian reinforcement? Also the camp coming? That's a lot of things. Alright, set up our 
range here. And then we've lure some over. We haven't destroyed many buildings. The army from Bohemia was drawing ever closer. The Mongols were running out of time to defeat the Polish army and neutralize the threat from Bohemia. No, 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 that's a lot of units. Come, 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 protect the, the nest of bees. Oh, this is not good. Oh, come on. We might have taken on more than we can shoot. No, 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 no. Maybe if we arrive. Yeah, okay. Oh, clutch. Oh, that guy almost died. Alright, we have destroyed the Polish army. Our army is destroyed too. <laughs> Despite being outnumbered by the European armies, the Mongols were victorious. As fire scorched the farmlands of Lignitz, Europe reeled in horror. The ingenuity of the Mongol Empire had brought a terrifying new kind of destruction to the doorstep of the West. Alrighty, introducing gunpowder to the West, what could go wrong? Alrighty, we get some normatic music. A lot of people have been huge fans of throat thinging, or who might, that's what we typically call it in Chinese. First Warriors on Campaign. The arrival of the Mongols in Europe was a calamity for which the West was grossly unprepared. In the years since Genghis Khan's rise, the Mongols' military had perfected his strategies and invaded with unstoppable ferocity. Campaigns were planned years in advance. Scouts would survey the terrain, burning farmlands as they went. The clear land would create a highway of pasture for the forthcoming army and their animals. Using a decimal system of organization, a Mongol army could be tens of thousands strong and still communicate effectively, moving swiftly and feed every one of its warriors for years at a time. Though discipline, practice, and endurance, uh, through discipline, practice, and endurance, the Mongol army remained ready for action and poised for conquest. Yes, the decimal system is what I've been talking about with the 10,000 uh, per unit. It's called like a tuan, I think, uh, a tuan, I think it's what the term is. Um, basically, you have one man in charge of 10, and then one man in charge of 10 men who are in charge of 10. So that man's in charge of like 100, and then a man in charge of 1,000, and then general in charge of 10,000, and so forth. So that's what they mean by the decimal system of organization. And then we get a, a little bit of culture element. Ma uh, tou the horse headed instrument. Nomads followed their flocks and herds. A Mongol family might move up to 30 times a year to seek fresh grazing. Nomadic people civilization is different from the settled uh, civilization. It is based on open field movement and horseback riding lifestyle. The music is uh, one of the most important elements of this kind of way of life. A central theme in Mongolian music is the horse. All Mongol life was lived on horses. That's part of the, the Mongol identity, is the music of the horse. The most iconic Mongolian instrument was the Morin Khor. Morin Khor in a Mongolian language, it means horse head fiddle. The strings came from a horse's tail, 120 hairs for the top, female string, and 150 for the bottom, male string. Everything to do with the Morin Corps related to horses, and it could even imitate their sounds. A distinctive aspect of Mongolian music is throat singing. Throat 
singing is an ancient way of singing that imitates the echo from the nature. Throat singing is the sound of the step, the wind, the earth, the animals. Music was also used to tell stories. In this praise song, two horses run away from Genghis Khan for a life in the wild. But they miss his kindness, and so they return. The prospect of being immortalized in a praise song was a powerful motivation for warriors on the battlefield. Alrighty, uh, so I know a lot of people are fans of throat singing, uh, and for the ma tou qin or the morin core, uh, the the two string uh, obviously also gives inspiration to ar hu, another very traditional uh, Chinese instrument. But all these instruments are from even older cultures. Uh, Mongolian as a culture is relatively new. Um, I don't think the term Mongols um, technically could you know predate perhaps the eleventh century. Um, so all these instruments definitely all came from even uh, more normatic influence out west, uh, even far beyond to maybe even the Xiongnu times, and even if you keep going back, probably even earlier than that. But you see similar uh, renditions of this style of instrument with the two string using horsehair um, to play, uh, both in Mongolian culture as well as Chinese culture. Arhu is very classic. Um, and also has the saimat, which is the horse racing song, which is quite popular, and it's also designed to imitate horses. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this battle. Uh, that was actually quite stressful, because I thought perhaps we had to siege a fort afterward, and we saved those um, nest of bees at the end to clutch us a victory against uh, the elite knights of Europe. So see you guys next time, as I'm actually kind of curious what battle lies ahead now that we're in 1241. So until then, bye.